Uh, okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to this edition of the Spring Seminar. Uh, today we are delighted to have uh, Navamita Banerjee with us, uh, who's at ISER Bhopal. Uh, and uh, she's going to tell us about uh, 3D flat space holography inspired by ADS3 CFT2. Over to you, Navamita. Okay, thanks a lot, Siddharth. Um, actually, I have never been to ICTS, and I was hoping that this year in July there would be, there was supposed to be a program by Alok, and I thought I'll finally be visiting ICTS, but Corona spoiled my plan again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start. Okay, so I will uh, basically uh, talk, I mean, I'll mostly report on uh, works by others, and just tell you at the end of the day what we have done in this field. So what we will try to understand is, from whatever knowledge we have uh, from ADS3 CFT2 duality, how much of it we can actually take from it and can try to construct a flat space, 3D flat space dual. Okay, so that's what this talk is going to be about. And feel free to stop me at any point uh, if anything is not clear. So let's start. Okay. Ooh. Sorry, I don't know what I have done. Just a sec. Yeah. So can you can you see my presentation? Can you see my presentation? I was muted, sorry. Yeah, I can't see your presentation. Oh, sorry, just a sec again. Yeah, now I can see it. Okay, great. But probably it's not full screen, no? Yeah, it's not full screen. Okay, just a sec. Uh, okay, good. Uh, somehow it didn't go into full screen. Uh, just a sec, here we go. Fine? Yeah, yeah, now it's good. So first, let us start with the question that why in 3D? Because of course, we don't live in 3D. So why am I studying three-dimensional space? So that is because uh, gravity in three space time dimension is special because we know that there is no dynamical gravity. But with this statement, we might even think that if there is no dynamical gravity, then why are you studying it? This is because that for a large variety of gravitational solution, I mean, you, you can see that whenever the global topological structures are non-trivial, I mean, whenever there are non-trivial loops in the global topology, then there are, I mean, for example, if there are holonomies, then it's not just flat space, but of, of course, every solution is locally flat, but their topology can be very different. So you, we do have a large variety of solutions, and hence it makes the structure rich. Then 3D gravity is renormalizable, and thus a perfect toy model to study some quantum aspects of gravity. Most importantly, holography is reasonably well understood, at least in the context of ADS3 gravity. So we understand some good features of the dual field theory for three-dimensional gravity when it is asymptotically continuous. And then another good feature is that 3D gravity can also be alternately viewed as a pure gauge theory, which is known as transformation. So this gives us a lot of technical support to study this field. In this talk, what we shall do is, we shall be using the chan Simon formulation. And our goal would be to look for a holographic dual of 3D flat supergravity theories. Okay. Now, before I start uh, to find the holographic dual of 3D flat theories, let us just recall that what are the lessons that we already have from ADS3 CFT2 process. Okay, so 3D gravity in asymptotically ADS space is dual to a CFT2. And this is one of the most well understood holographic duality. We, we know that there are excellent work by Witten, Malasena, Oguri, Brown Heno, Strominger, and then Devon Kutasab Saibab, and many other people. Okay, of course, recent works by Rajesh and I, I have just uh, written down the references which are like the primary. So what are, what are the main points that we know of this quality? First is asymptotic symmetry of ADS3 gravity is a centrally extended Virasaro symmetry, and that is exactly the symmetry of the dual CFT. So the symmetries of the two theories are same. Point two, 
there exists a BTC black hole solution, which is globally different from ADS3. Locally, of course, BTC is same as ADS3, but globally it's different. It's a black hole solution. And the entropy is of the symmetry algebra of the CFT2, which is the velocity of symmetry. Okay, so this is another important point. Third point is this dual CFT that we are talking about can actually be constructed as a Liouville theory. So we actually know what this CFT is. We, we know it's, uh, it's, it's Lagrangian and we can actually work with it. Point four, supersymmetric extensions of this, uh, of this duality can al also be performed. I mean, not just pure, I mean, not just gravity in ADS, asymptotically ADS space, but if you, if you have like its super partners, then the corresponding dual theory, their symmetries and their solutions, everything is much well understood in this case. And another very important point is following that the non-trivial global degrees of freedom of 3D gravity can actually be identified in, the, uh, in a string theory on ADS3 as the holomorphic or anti-holomorphic vertex operators integrated over quantities on the watershed. So this, is, uh, this work is by Givan Kutasov. So this is a precise way of understanding the duality. Okay, so these are our lessons that we already have. Now our goal is following. We are in search of a similar duality for asymptotically flat ADS, flat 3D gravity. Okay, that's uh, what. Yeah. Uh, now the, just, just one question regarding your previous slide. Yes. Uh, when you say that, you know, like the Liouville theory is the exact dual CFT, what you mean is that it captures the, you know, like the classical gravity. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. Mean, I mean, the loops in the bulk uh, or, or, or in some sense, the one by n corrections in the boundary theory are not captured by you. No, are not captured. No, no. It, it's a classical equivalence. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we will come back to this slide again towards the end. But these are the main things that we know. And uh, to answer you, Loga, to, to understand this duality beyond classical limit, this fifth point is very important. And of course, the way Maldasena Ogudi forms it, like how to understand, I mean, how to really see the solutions in, in both the spaces to be same, that is also a very important step to understand this. Okay. So we will, we will try to get good. So the plan of the talk. Uh, the first two points I have already talked about, that why I'm working in 3D and what we already know from ATS3 CFT2. Now, in the rest of the talk, what I'll do is, I'll very quickly try to tell you how to get this BMS, uh, where BMS is nothing but the asymptotic symmetries of flat spaces, from the chan simon formulation of 3D gravity. Okay, this will give us a lot of technical hold on the subject. Then I will very quickly talk about the supersymmetric extensions of uh, BMS3. In this, I'll uh, tell you like how one does, sorry, how one does the asymptotic symmetry analysis for uh, 3D super, I mean, 3D super gravity theories. Then I'll talk about the bosonic solutions with non-trivial topologies, which, would, which will have different topologies than, than just the ordinary flat space. And then what are the, what, what is it that we learn from uh, up to studying this? Okay, so that's what is this outlook. And then I'll go to the dual theory that we think would be the right candidate for the holographic dual of 3D flat gravity. I'll talk about that. And then finally, I'll end with uh, some outlook and implementations. And again, feel free to stop me at any point. Okay. So what is BMS? We, we all uh, more or less know it, but uh, let, me, let me still state it. This is the symmetry algebra at null infinity for gravity theories with flat space asymptotic. And this is known as uh, Bondi, Van der Boek, Meisner, and Satz algebra. By the name of the inventors, we, we just call it to be BMS algebra. Okay. In, three, in, in three and four spacetime dimensions, BMS algebra is infinite dimensional. And uh, translation generators are known, I mean, and the trans, sorry, the transformation generators are known as super translations and super rotation generators. In higher than four dimensions, and particularly in even space-time dim dimensions, with a relaxed boundary condition on the metric, one can still get the super translations, and uh, the super rotation is not there. But instead of that, the uh, 
Lorentz transformations. So super translations and Lorentz transformations actually gives us the asymptotic symmetry of uh, flat space, asymptotically flat space times in higher than four even space time dimensions. Now in this talk, I will be only interested in uh, asymptotically flat gravity in three space time dimensions. Okay, so although many of it is true for four dimensions, but in this talk we will only be talking about three dimensions. Okay. So the next question comes is following that how do we get the asymptotic symmetry algebra? Now, probably many of you know it, but anyway, still let me tell you very briefly how one gets the asymptotic symmetry algebra. This particular paper is a very good reference for this. So for flat space, one actually does it using the Penrose compactification of null infinity. So assumption of an asymptotic series expansion in 1 over R actually is, becomes equivalent to the smoothness condition at sky plus. So this is the basic, I mean, basic point that you need to put into the computation and then you get. Okay, so basically let's start with a 3D gravity, just ordinary gravity. So action is square root GR. And then consider a metric with proper follow that describes the, the, the describes the geometry of an asymptotically flat manifold. By that, I mean that whenever I'll go to the infinity in, in my R direction, this metric should actually become eta mu, the flat space metric. Next, so, so G menu need not be eta menu. It is not eta menu. Only when you are, you are going to the asymptotic infinite direction, it should behave as eta menu. And then you look for isometries such that they leave this asymptotic form in band. Okay, so the transformations of G mu, the isometry transformations of G mu should still give you G mu when you are going to larger. This is the demand that you put, and then you just need to find the distilling fields, and their symmetry algebra is what gives you BMS. I mean, that symmetry algebra that you get out of this is what is known as BMS. Okay. Now, although I said it like in few points, but actually implementing it, it is pretty non trivial Whereas the implementation of the same criteria, as we will see, it is much easier in the Chan Simon formulation of 3D gravity. And is, you can only do it for 3D gravity because in 4D, you do not have an equivalent Chan Simon description for gravity. So in 4D, if you want to find the asymptotic symmetry or in any other D, so you should basically follow what I just said now. But in 3D, we will see that the same thing we can actually implement in a much simpler. So let's just see what is this Chan Simon formulation of 3D gravity. Okay. So to do that, let me quickly tell you what is Chan Simon theory in 3D. Now, pure Chan Simon theory is governed by this action. Okay. So here A, so, so let me let, let me just tell you what different quantities that are appearing here are. Okay. This K is known as the level of the theory. And classically, I mean if we are Working at the classical level, this is just a constant. We have no constraint on it classically. M, so this is 4 pi, we know this. M is a space-time space -time manifold. So for us, it's a three-dimensional space-time manifold. A, appearing here, is a Lie algebra valued one form. And in particular, in terms of the generators of your algebra, you can expand A as A mu A, T A, D mu A, T A. So these A mu A's will be your uh, gauge base. This notation, the curly bracket with a comma, actually represents the non-degenerate invariant bilinear form that takes values in, the, in this Lie algebra space. Basically, this is the metric in the Lie algebra space. So that's all that we need to know to compute this quantity. Now, the most uh, striking feature of Chan Simon theory is that the uh, equation of motion is very simple. It's just f equal to zero. Okay, where by f I mean this quantity. And the solutions are pure gauge. Okay. So you can just readily see that if you set A equal to G inverse DG, where this G is a Lie algebra group element, Lie group element, then that will satisfy this equation trivially. And hence, basically, all you have in this theory are like pure gauge. Good. So on shell, so from here we can readily understand that on shell CS theory does not have any bulk dynamical degree of freedom and hence it's a topological field. Okay. Furthermore, since it's a gauge theory, you can choose a gauge. I mean, particularly I have chosen here this radial gauge conditions 
and once you choose this gauge then the solution actually looks like the following okay so what are various quantities appearing here this d is just derivative operator this b is a field that only is a function of r whereas a can depend on the other two directions that you have okay so the entire radial dependence of your gauge field can be extracted in this field b and the a that is sitting here does not have any area okay. so here this a is only a function of u and phi if if i denote the three coordinates by r u and phi then b will only depend on r and this a depends on u and phi and the most important part is even after uh, using the equation of motion and your gauge freedom you cannot fix it okay so this this a actually represents the residual part of your gauge field that cannot be fixed by using equation of motion this is a feature of uh, this uh, this theory that you cannot even after using the equation of motion and your gauge freedom you cannot find a complete solution there is still a part that you have no hold on and that's in this case i have denoted by a Uh, so, hello so yes. this a has two components a subscript u and a subscript phi yes a has two components exactly a okay. subscript u and a subscript phi and we will come back to it yeah so the conserved charges so okay so up to this point we are seeing that there is a part that is not fixed okay so the conserved charges that correspond to this residual uh, global part of this gauge symmetry i mean since you would still have a part that is not fixed you will have a part of your symmetry that is also not fixed and we will just take the global part of that and construct the conserved charge corresponding to that global part of the symmetry and that that symmetry is what will give you the symmetry algebra at the point okay so this is this prescription is by brown and heno and this is how you can actually uh, compute the symmetry at the boundary of of a chancerman theory in any manifold m what would be the symmetry of of this theory when you are going to the boundary of that manifold is constructed by this description any question so far okay if not let me proceed okay so then the next point is how can i see pure 3d gravity as a chancerman theory Okay, so so far we have understood what chancerman theory is, and I have told you that three D gravity is equivalent to chancerman. Let's see how that works. Okay, so to do that, let's start. So three D pure gravity we know is also a topological theory because there is no dynamical degree of freedom. So one feature that is common between both gravity and chancerman is in three D is that both of them are topological. Now the isometry. the isometry group for 3d gravity is a non compact group and it's it's iso 2.1 this is basically just my poincare symmetry group of 3d gravity the non zero commutators of this lie algebra are the following okay so these j's you can think of it them as the rotation generators and p's as translation generators and that's what it is now what you do is if you consider your chancerman theory but now with a with the gauge group being iso 2.1 iso 2.1 and expand the chan simon gauge field in terms of the generators of iso 2.1 and put it back in your chan simon action so what i'm saying is let's just go back here let's take this t let's uh, for, for us the lie algebra is iso 2.1 take the generators expand a in terms of that use the invariant bilinears for this particular lie algebra and evaluate these action that's what we are doing here to do that then of course this expansion will bring in to the picture two different fields like one i have denoted by e and one i have denoted by omega and then you can write down the chancerman action and you will see that the chancerman action will just look like this so this action when you expand a as this and use the metric for iso 2 comma 1 then the chancerman action will simply boil down to it's a very easy computation to this so of course of course you you must have noticed that there is no k sitting here so of course to see this identification i need to set the parameter k to 1 over 4g and the manifold m the three dimensional manifold m now here is a cross product of a compact manifold and a non compact direction r that you can take to be your time so at this point we are what we are seeing is that classically the two actions are equivalent 
So this is just in classical equivalence. By that I mean that the two actions are equivalent. One can see that both of them, one can go from one to other if I take the gauge group of the transformer to be this non-compact gauge group ISO2. So far. So what is the uh, what is the invariant uh, product in this uh, group? Uh, the PP is delta AB or what is that? Yeah, yeah, PP is delta AB. Yes. So I will, I will I will show you. I will when I will go to the next section. I mean when I will go to the supersymmetric case, I'll explicitly show you what the invariant product. Okay. Thanks. Good. So 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 far all we have seen is that the classical actions are equivalent, but there are more. Okay. Actually, the classical symmetries are also also identical. So how do we see that? To understand that, let's just do the following. Now a generic gauge transformation in the Chan-Simon theory will be parameterized again by, I mean, in term, along these two generators that you have, P and J. So a generic uh, gauge transformation parameter would be a scalar in this basis. And the gauge transformation will just simply look like this. So the transformation of A would, would just be this quantity. This is just the gauge transformation rule. And what you can show is that this gauge transformation of the Chan-Simon theory is exactly identical to local Lorentz and diffeomorphism transformations of 3D gravity on shell. Okay? By that, what I mean is follow. If you do this and see its effect and, and just rewrite A in terms of E and omega and try to understand what this transformation would mean for E and omega, you will see that once you are imposing the equations of motion, they are exactly the transformations of E and omega under low range and diffusions. Okay, so not only the actions are same, but even the classical symmetries are same. Not just that, even more. So since we have seen that the gauge transformations, I mean, this is a statement about the symmetry everywhere, throughout the manifold. And the statement is that the gauge transformation is equivalent to local low range and diffeomorphism in the bar. Now, if you go to the boundary, you can try to understand what these transformations would be if, you, if I'm going to the boundary of the manifold. And what we will see that this residual boundary symmetry of chan simon theory would exactly be the boundary symmetry of your flat space boundary. If you are going to the asymptotic boundary, the symmetry that you will have here would exactly be identical to, to this. And this is what we will, I mean, this, this is not, this is a result of a calculation. If you do that, if you do this residual boundary symmetry calculation, you will see that you will get, get BMS. So it, you will also get exactly the same symmetry that any asymptotic flat space solutions. I mean, any, that would be the symmetry of any asymptotically flat theory when you are, when you are in 3 So that's, that's it. Any questions so far? Uh, so just one question. Uh, you mean here that uh, if I so your residual symmetry in the CS theory uh, was parameterized by this little a that you had. Uh, that was the part of the gauge field. Yeah, I mean that is not the symmetry. The symmetry transformation parameter would be some lambda. Oh right, right, right. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, but, okay, okay. Yeah, I mean all, all I tried to say is that that a part is not fixed, so you still have some gauge freedom left, and we try to we want to understand what is the what is that symmetry. I mean what is that transformation and what is the corresponding symmetry. Yes, yeah. just give me a minute. In the next transparency, I'm going to show you exactly how it works. Okay, okay. So let's let's do that. So this is what Siddharth was asking. So let us just do do it explicitly for for this pure gravity case. Okay. So here, just just for our understanding, I am denoting the three coordinates at null infinity by u r and phi. Okay, phi is the compact direction. U is my radial direction. Sorry, r is my radial direction, and u is time. And the small a gauge field that I told you about, I'm choosing it to be like this. Okay, you notice that of course this small a would also have components along the three p's and three j's, but the choice, but the a that I have taken here is very special. It, for example, it only has the, the phi component of it, a phi only has a non-zero non value along j1. It does not have anything along J0 and J-1 or J2 or J3, whatever you call it. The other two, along other two J directions, I, I have not turned on anything. I'm sorry. I mean, along J0 and J1, I have turned on, but uh, uh, along J2, I have not turned on anything. And similarly, for I have only turned on a component along P0, but not along P1 and P2. Okay, similarly, uh, there is a, the, the, this part is also highly constrained. 
so this is a choice that i have made you could have you could have taken any other choice also and finally it would work but this is a simplest possible choice that one can make and the choice comes from the following statement what you want is following you want your metric to be the bondi metric when you are going to the boundary right so if you construct the metric by by this choice of a you will see that the metric turns out to be the bondi metric you you need to take this take this component non zero minimum to get this otherwise you will not get bondi metric okay so that's the most important uh, most important part here that you need to choose this residual gauge field properly at null infinity so that you get asymptotically flat so so this is the form of a and now what we want to understand that what kind of gauge transformations i can perform such that this form of the gauge field does not change okay that's what we have to do right we wanted our metric to be flat metric at large r and then we wanted to understand what kind of isometric transformations i can perform on this metric such that its boundary behavior does not change okay such that the fall off does not change so here also in chan simon what we are what we need to take is the right fall off and then we are looking for gauge transformations non trivial gauge transformations which are non zero at the boundary but such that under that gauge transformation this fall off does not change that's what we are looking so let's let's just parameterize our gauge transformation as the most generic gauge transformation like i have parameterized it by these two variables xi a and epsilon a and and these guys like this p xi and uh, this these are all functions of u and phi and all these these two fields and these parameters are constrained by the following two conditions first these guys has to satisfy the equation of motion at boundary and the gauge transformation should i mean and these guys has to transform properly under this gauge transformation so if you impose these two conditions what you will be able to do is you will be able to fix all these parameters you will know what these guys are and then finally we need to define the global charges which is just this quantity it's again the inner product of this transformation generator lambda with delta of a phi notice that here you don't really, I mean this relation does not give you the global charges it gives you the variation of the global charges and then finally you need to integrate it so you we need to integrate this relation we need to integrate this we need to integrate this relation to find the charges and once you have done that then with those charges you can find the corresponding symmetry algebra so the symmetry algebra that we talk about here is basically the symmetry algebra of this bonds of charges that's what we are doing. is this point clear hello yeah okay yeah and then if you basically derive this algebra in terms of various modes of your fields mm -hmm. then you will get this to be the symmetry algebra okay so for asymptotically flat spaces here j's are the modes of so let's get back j's are the modes of these fields and p's are the modes of these fields so if you rewrite this symmetry algebra in terms of the modes of j's and p's then what you get that the, the asymptotic symmetry algebra will just look like this and as many of you can already identify that this is nothing but your bms3 a special bms3 algebra where there is no central extension in the j j term but there is a central extension here you have a question sita uh, yeah just uh, just to uh, yeah. clarify or so you said there is a choice of the uh, res residual gauge field that you write down right this fall off that you chose yeah. so if i if i don't make this so uh, i understand this this choice is to get this bondi metric right uh, but, but the statement is that you you are allowed a, a larger class of uh, you can. yeah yeah you can i mean you will see that i mean when i will go so this okay so let me restate it this is the minimal choice that you have to take to get this metric mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because from this you can actually read out the e's the vlvns and from those vlvns you can try to compute what would be the metric you want your metric to have this form so this is the minimal choice but any gauge equivalent choice of this is also possible right right but, but uh, okay 
So, uh, uh, is is any other choice gauge equivalent to this, or is is it like you have a different? You you can also have a different class of all of yeah, this. No, no. I mean, you can get the capital A from this small A by choosing any B. Right. Right. So right. so that freedom you have. The right. the function of R that you have, you could have chosen it to be anything. Just all you need to make sure is that when you are going to the boundary, that should give you the right call. That's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you, you will. Uh, I mean, when I'll go to the supersymmetric section, you will again see it even more explicit. So, hi, I had one small thing to just uh, say hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, um, yeah, just, just, uh, just saying that perhaps it's probably good to uh, mention that we are, we, are, we are actually dealing with I mean, Einstein gravity here because, I mean, otherwise, as you know, know very well, the J, your JJ will, will also get another central extension. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I showed that I'm working with S equal to square root G R. Yeah, right, right. So I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that if you just, I mean, emphasize the fact, fact that it's just, I mean, flat space. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, asymptotically flat space could could also entail those those terms as well, right? So yeah, that's. I mean, what 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 you're saying is obviously right. I just uh, just was mentioning. Yeah, that, yeah. That, you certainly know, doing that. You are certainly yeah. doing that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, after after a few minutes, I'll add more things. Okay. Now, now Mr. Hi, uh, is there a way to get a BMS at uh, time like infinity in three dimensions using this approach? Uh, um, is there a sensible notion you think uh, of BMS? Uh, I think it should be possible. I mean, here the things that we have chosen here is at null infinity, right? That's, yes. that's all I have yes, taken. Yes. But if you do not do this, okay. So, so the statement is following: that chan Simon is equivalent to three D gravity is a generic statement, right? And all I am doing is I am using it using this equivalence at null infinity to understand the symmetries of both the sides. Mm -hmm. If you are interested okay. in, in time like infinity, you have to study chan Simon also at time like. Okay. okay. But this only works in 3D. Yes, yes. Okay, good. Hi, Navamitadi. I have a question. Huh. So, uh, is it also possible to kind of get some kind of this uh, BMS near the horizon? Uh, BMS. Not in 3D, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, right, right. So, okay. Very good question. So, actually, you see? Okay. Let, let, I'll just show you one thing and hopefully that would. Good. So you see, this is what the gauge field is. Okay. And all I'm saying is the entire radial dependence I have absorbed into B. Now, where do you want to put your boundaries up to? You can, this entire prescription is so rigid that you can put your boundary to any value B, R equal to R. For my job, I was choosing it to be R equal to infinity and was doing this entire analysis at R equal to infinity. But you can actually do it at any R equal to us and can carry on that. Yes. All, all you would be demanding is following. Yes. Ah, all you would be demanding that these relations are true at R equal to RC. And that will tell you how these transformation parameters are determined in terms of P and J. And then you will use this. Then you will. Sorry, I'm so poor with. I don't know. Sorry, guys. Can you can you all see it? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, yeah, just full screen. <laughs> Sorry again. No problem. So, and then, uh, Nila, then you have to basically implement these conditions at R equal to RC and can find these uh, parameters in terms of P and J, and you will get the algebra at R equal to RC. So, at any, this, this prescription will tell you to map the two theories at any RC, at any value of it. Okay. Okay. Yeah? Uh, just just to f uh, follow up on that, do you expect that at any value of RC, the you will get the same algebra? No, because that would depend uh, on what these charges would turn out to be. Right, but, uh, but I mean for horizon can be special. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, so at some, I mean, arbitrary R R C. Do you do you have have any expectation of what exactly the what what the algebra might be? No, I have not worked it out, so I okay. I don't know. But I think okay. at at Horizon, it will again be something like it is like BMS Horizon that people have already talked about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think people have actually worked it out in the yeah. three, three dimension on I mean on the Horizon, but I do not know of some uh, something that. Has been worked out at some some no no at some a other RC no 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 because and that that yeah I mean that that might be something interesting to do actually why I mean why do you think that uh, yeah I, I mean, mean if you want to interpol it it might might be it might be something uh, you know if if you have an RC which you can I mean tune from I mean from from the boundary and 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 uh, you, know, so you want to see the horizon. how along RC this yeah yeah some kind yeah of that 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 that. That might be a nice thing to do, actually. Yeah, but yes, I would agree. But uh, what I was uh, trying to tell Nilo is that, is that it is possible in principle. Yeah, right, right. In practice, uh, okay. At least I think for just gravity, it should definitely be possible even in practice. Uh, for other cases, there is a little non triviality, and the non triviality sure. simply comes from this relation. See, what you directly get out of this analysis is delta q. Okay? Mm -hmm. But to get the symmetry algebra, what you need is q. So now, it, it, this is this is the little non-trivial part here. It, you have to do this analysis to get the, to get Q from delta Q, and that's that's pretty not. So at certainly, if you are working at boundary at asymptotic boundary, it is possible. Uh, can I make a small comment? Yes. Yeah. Or in the file, of course you should. You yeah. are co Go ahead. Yeah. The the point is that there is no natural boundary condition uh, at any generic R equals to R C, right? So when R tends to infinity, if I'm saying that my phase space is asymptotically flat, right. that, that gives me a boundary condition and that gives me an expression for the small. No, 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 no. See, that, that's the good thing of your gate choice. You, your A, small a, does not care about B. The boundary condition that you are talking about, you will put that in B. No, B has the dependence on R. No, no, that, that is that I agree, but I'm saying that Saying that my phase space consists of asymptotically flat space time mm -hmm. gives me a natural choice for small a. Right. Right? So, for instance, these uh, that I have chosen a uh, constant uh, uh, coefficient for j1 and and uh, the, j, the uh, coefficient for j2 is zero. This is coming from the fact that I demand that asymptotically my space time is uh, flat. Would be, this. Would be this. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But but for a generic R equals to R C. I, I don't have a, a natural choice of uh, such boundary condition. No. Yes, you don't have this choice, but you can write a generic one. Yeah, yeah I, I can definitely write a generic one. And, and I, I, as, as, uh, as somebody was saying, that, that should make sure that uh, if I have a black hole horizon in the bulk uh, and a bound time in a null infinity, then if I write a generic boundary condition at some R equals to RC, it should uh, smoothly interpolate between these two. Right. Right, that's true. But at a, gener at a generic value uh, at RC, you certainly cannot start with this A. Because this A, you have written it because you want it to be, uh, you want the metric to be this, which is only true at asymptotic. Yeah, this is what you were saying, Arun. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yes. Good. Anything else? Hi, Navamitadi. Yes. Yeah, uh, may I ask a question? So uh, this is uh, probably a very elementary question, but I'm uh, a little confused. I mean, uh, when uh, the black hole horizon is being talked about, uh, I mean, uh, is there any black hole solution in uh, 3D gravity up, uh, in asymptotically flat place? I thought uh, there are no, no, no black hole horizons uh, anyway, right? Black hole solution, yeah. It's just in pure gravity, there is no. I mean, all solutions are just min Right. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was asking. And uh, the second question is if uh, all solutions are locally min Yeah, hmm. but there is no black hole solution. There are, but see, I mean, it does not have to be a black hole horizon. It can be a horizon of a different kind. You will see that there are different kind of cosmological solutions, which are not directly. I mean, the, their topologies are different than min Okay, and there is a Cauchy horizon. There is a cosmological horizon associated. So that is possible. But yes, you are right that there, is, there are no black hole solutions. Thank you. And uh, one more question is, I mean, this is just out of curiosity. Uh, in case uh, you have a manifold with, uh, let's say, uh, some uh, multiple boundaries, uh, 
uh, would you have uh, a, a separate independent copy of uh, BMS on uh, each of the boundary or would they in, uh, be, uh, be in some way related? I, would not, I, I do not have an answer to this because if, I mean BMS will only appear at the asymptotic boundary. You are saying asymptotically there are multiple boundaries? Yeah, I mean I'm thinking of something uh, for example uh, in uh, 2D uh, gravity models mm -hmm. uh, in ADS2 uh, there can be uh, uh, ADS2 space time with uh, multiple boundaries. I mean uh, that's what uh, has been important in the study of uh, the JT gravity path integral in recent times. Uh, so I was, uh, my motivation was uh, sort of uh, that scenario. Uh, okay. we... But here, uh, here uh, hmm. uh, I don't know if I understand your question correctly or not, but here what we are doing is we are studying gravity in a particular background, right? My, my manifold yes. is given. So, hmm. so given a manifold, I mean one manifold, it's not that I'm changing my manifold. Yeah, yeah, I mean I'm saying that given a manifold, Given the manifold uh, with, uh, let's say, multiple boundaries, uh, I mean, would there be a new BMS? Uh, the boundary conditions are what you specify. Uh, would there be a uh, separate BMS on each boundary? Or if the question is too vague, uh, maybe we can come back to it later and maybe I can um, correspond. I to definitely you. think that there would be BMS at every boundary because you want a field to be, I mean, you want a metric to be determined. You know? But in okay. what sense there would be different, I wouldn't know. I mean, I, but we can, we can think about it. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, just a uh, just a comment about uh, finding uh, BMS uh, uh, in the in a finite distance uh, in this uh, 3D asymptotic flat manifold. So maybe my I guess that there are some constructions uh, in 4D uh, where you just uh, demand that there is a universal structure on any null surface situated any finite distance. And uh, the group that preserves that universal structure is the BMS group. So in that way, I think uh, one can also try to recover the BMS in uh, 3D. I mean, that will be completely different from what you are doing. But uh, in, uh, in that sense, I think one can uh, recover BMS uh, in any what, null surface. What I was saying is that only when you are asymptotic infinity, your metric is of this form. I mean, at any fine, I mean, locally at any finite R, the metric is just Minkowski. Yeah. Right? yeah. If, if you are, if you are, I mean, if you are looking at uh, a Minkowski space time, but if your, your space time can be very different. Like, for example, let's take Schwarzschild. Right. right? So, in in, in 4D, I'm talking about in 4D. In Schwarzschild, in the bulk, it's different. But when you are going to the boundary, Schwarzschild will have this form. Of course, in, in, the, in the four dimensional. I mean, the, the four dimensional boundary metric, whatever it is, it is certainly different from this, but Schwarzschild will look like that, right? But not at any finite R. Any finite R, it is Schwarzschild. Right, but uh, a null surface in infinite R in Schwarzschild mm -hmm. can, uh, can be endowed this BMS symmetry. These are the new uh, developments made by Prabhu, Chandra Shekharan, uh, those people. So, so I, 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 do not know how to implement that in this case, but you, you are saying that even at a finite R, one should be able to, uh, for, a, for a null surface, one should be able to give it a structure and then... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, it, that, that is quite different what you are mentioning, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that I understand. It's okay. I mean, we are just discussing. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. okay, okay. Good. Good. So, so this is what is a, a restricted BMS. By that, I mean the, the JJ, the super translation generators, uh, there is no central extension to this algebra. Whereas to super translation and super rotation generators, you do get a central extension. This C2 is related to the K or the 4G that we have in, my, in our theory. So this is how we can see that how by studying CS, how by studying the symmetries of CS at its boundary, one can actually get BMS. And which is of course already expected because we know that we have already seen that CS and uh, chance CS and gravity are 3D gravity are equivalent and their symmetries are equal. So of course that we are getting this is not a surprise, but it just gives us a recipe to get the asymptotic symmetries of gravity. Okay, good. Okay, so let, let me just, uh, just, just say finally what we have. 
So we see that the CS formulation, the Chanceman formulation of 3D gravity is a very successful tool to understand various properties of gravity. This was first established by Witten uh, and later rigorously used by Heno, mostly in the context of asymptotically ADS gravity theories. In the past decade, Barnich started it. So he started using the same tool to understanding the asymptotic properties of pure gravity. And then, then, then he found the centrally extended VMS symmetry. And by now, this technique is highly successful and all possible supersymmetric and has been extensions of VMS3 and no. Uh, there are work by Barnich, there are work by uh, Barnich and collaborators, Tronkoso and collaborators, Dumiller and collaborators, I should have said Arjun and collaborators, sorry Arjun, and uh, some of our works. Yeah, I mean, no, no, no worries at all, don't, don't worry about it. Yeah, but since you were here, I should probably say Arjun and collaborators. <laughs> Thank you. Just that I probably have written the name of the most senior person in that. Okay, so, so uh, these are like the things that, that, that are by now known. Okay, so for all possible extensions of gravity in 3D, in presence of other matter fields, the, the asymptotic symmetries for those theories are bound by now well understood. Okay, what more? Let's see. Okay, now let, let me tell you that there is an alternate way to get this BMS3 algebra. So alternately, these BMS3 algebras can be obtained as a flat limit of ADS3 asymptotic algebras. So namely the Virasoro algebra. The, the way you do it is following. You start with a, a copy of Virasoro algebra. I have denoted it by L plus and L minus. So here I have written two Virasoros with two central charges in general, C plus and C minus. And then redefine generators and central charges as follows. So you define PM generators from LMs by this relation that you take a sum of L plus M and L minus of minus N and then multiply it with a parameter epsilon and take the limit epsilon goes to zero. You demand that in this limit, PM is finite. Okay? Similarly, JM is also finite. You notice that in the definition of JM, I have not multiplied it by any epsilon. Similarly, you define two new central charges. These, these are uh, known as inono wignat contraction, but the name is not important. What we are trying to do is we are basically rescaling re our Virasoro generators and then redefining new generators from these rescaled Virasoro generators. What is going on? Can you guys help me? How do I minimize it? This does not work. Okay, sorry. Maybe there's a zoom out option. Uh... Sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'll just share it once more. Yeah. yeah. Zoom out. Let me just. Uh, okay, I don't see anything. Okay. Anyway. So, uh, so if you do this, if you do this rescaling and rewrite the algebra in terms of these newly defined generators and these two newly defined parameters, then you actually get this algebra. And you see, this algebra is exactly uh, the completely centrally extended BMS3 algebra, where you also have a central extension for JJ. Okay, you can call this to be uh, a BMS3 algebra as well. But if, you, if your definition of BMS is that it is the symmetry algebra of asymptotically flat gravity theories, then for that, this particular central term is C. Okay, that's what we have seen a few minutes ago. Okay? But uh, in general, this is also, this is just a central extension of BMS3, I mean, of the asymptotic symmetry algebra of flat 3D gravity. So what I'm trying to say is that this is a complete, I mean, different way, an alternate way, and way to construct new algebras from the knowledge of the symmetry algebra of asymptotically ADS3 space types or asymptotically ADS3 gravity theories. Okay, so this is uh, this is a new way. I mean, this is an alternate way. And what can be what one can do is one can actually start working with all the supersymmetric extensions of Virasoro algebras and try to do this construct contraction and try to get the new symmetry algebras from it. So this is what we actually tried. 
so the supersymmetry extensions of BMS3 algebra were studied uh, long back, I mean, in, in 2016. And we also tried to understand the, the symmetry algebras in terms of some free fields that, that can be done by using this contraction technique. But there is a point. The point is that there are many distinct ways of taking this limit. The limit that we have just taken here, right? Like that we ha I have multiplied it by a small parameter. I have rescaled the generators in a particular way and taken a limit. So this procedure, you, you can implement it in many different and, and then, of course, you can demand that whatever algebra you are writing should finally satisfy your unitarity constraint. And even when you do that, you actually get multiple distinct algebras. Okay. So, so there, is, there are many BMS algebras in that sense, if you are constructing it just from the construction of an algebra person. And, uh, but, and thus, a direct asymptotic symmetry analysis of the corresponding supergravity theory is required because that only tells you that out of all these algebras that you have constructed, which really, which one really correspond to the asymptotic symmetry of your gravity. Okay, so that is why a direct computation is, uh, is important. And what we found is like in these papers, uh, that's exactly what we did for the supersymmetric cases. And we found that the, the algebras that we had constructed, only some of them can really be think of, I mean, we can really think of them as the asymptotic symmetry algebra of flat 3D gravities in presence of uh, fermions, in, in presence of other matter fields. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Not, then let me go ahead. So here, uh, I'll get back to Loga's question and also to uh, Orjun's question. And I'll just quickly tell you uh, how, what is this uh, algebra for, uh, what would be the asymptotic symmetry algebra for n equal to 2 comma 0 supergravity theory. Okay, this is just one example. Of course, as I told you that by now all the supersymmetric extensions and all the higher spin extensions are known. Uh, the asymptotic symmetry for all super, any, for all three dimensional supersymmetric uh, supergravity theories and higher spin gravity theories are known. So here I'm just giving you one example to tell you like how things look like. Okay. So the n equal to 2 comma 0 super Poincare algebra is this. As you can see, the first line we already have for Poincare symmetry, uh, for, 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 for just pure gravity. And here in presence of uh, the supercharges. Yes. Uh, so, sorry, I, I'm not um, completely familiar with this notation. So mm -hmm. when you say 2 comma 0, so it's a 3D, right? Uh, so what do you mean by 2 comma 0? That I have three, uh, I, I have three Qs. Okay, so this two comma, okay, <laughs> I understand your question. So, so, so these Qs can actually rotate among themselves. I could have also written it as one comma one and then they will not talk to each other. By two comma zero, I mean I have supercharges which will rotate among themselves. Okay, but, but so how does it uh, differ in this one comma one and two comma zero? It's a major in a condition. Yeah, the, the difference would be in two comma zero, I will also have this T. Okay, I have another generator. You can think of it as the R symmetry generator that will rotate these cues. If, if I would have taken 1, 1, then my symmetry algebra would only have J, P, and Q. And there would not have been any T or Z. Okay. So, so what is this general notation? What is N, comma M in general? I mean, um, you, usually, you know, like uh, in even dimensions, you know, like it means, uh, in, you know, in 2D and 6D and so on, uh, or 10D, there is... Uh, so all, I mean, chiral, chiral algebras, but all I mean here by this notation is following that I have two fermionic charges and they rotate. I mean, they, they, there is a R symmetry that rotates them among themselves. So I could have written down a two comma two algebra as well. Then I would have had two copies of these R symmetry generators also, where one would rotate in the, the fermionic generators in one sector and the other one would rotate the fermionic generators in another. Hi, hi, Navita. Hi. Hi, in this side here. Okay. Yeah. So, so in in uh, in three dimension, hmm. the irreducible spinner is a Majorana spinner, right? Yes. Whereas in two dimension, it is Majorana wild spinner. Right. So this uh, notation m comma n 
is it from the boundary perspective or is it from the no, no, no. actually you know i mean yeah i was not uh, this notation is coming from the fact that how i constructed it earlier i mean i constructed it by taking two copies of my virasoro i mean super extended virasoro algebra right so what i did there is actually in the one sector i took super virasoro and in the other sector i just took virasoro and i did a contract con contraction and i got the algebra Okay, but now here i want to so so that algebra is what i called n equal to 2 comma 0 i mean asymptotic symmetry of n equal to 2 comma 0 super gravity but mm -hmm. here the notation is simply following by this i mean i have a gravity theory mm -hmm. okay, where the symmetry algebra actually consists of two copies of fermionic generators that are mm -hmm. rotated that are mixed among them right right okay. but uh, in terms of just the uh, yeah super symmetry generators as as some fermionic generators in 3d gravity Uh, so the irreducible spinner for three, three dimension is Majorana spinner. So, so the unlike two uh, D or six D. So two D you have Majorana wild spinner. So you can you can actually talk about so many number of uh, left chiral Majorana spinners or so many number of right chiral Majorana spinners in two D. And uh, so the supersymmetry generators can be you know uh, two left chiral Majorana spinners and zero right chiral Majorana Majorana spinners. Then in that case it's two comma zero in three D. It is just Majorana spinner. Yes. Uh, so that's why uh, this notation is slightly confusing. If you, I mean, uh, two comma zero or. I mean, uh, uh, let me go to the fields and then you will see like how. I mean, I don't remember if I have it in this presentation or not. But in the paper, you will see how the fields are transforming under this transformation. Okay. 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 So, so given this algebra, the first step is we can first construct the non non degenerate bilinear. And here, uh, Doga, as you can see, that this J with P is eta, and J with J is also eta. Okay, and others one also you can compute. So it's not difficult. It's it's a simple calculation that one can do. But one important point to note here is following. Notice that the J with J J B bilinear in in this bilinear, I have a parameter called mu, and this mu can take any value. In particular, this mu can also be zero, and even then, the metric would be non-degenerate. But mu can be non-zero also. So what I have done is I have put in this parameter mu here. Similarly with t t, I have put in a parameter mu bar here. So unlike this coefficient, which is fixed to be one, and this coefficient, which is like fixed to be minus one, you you cannot make a different choice here because if you do that, then your metric would be not, it would not be non-degenerate. It, it would be degenerate. But this two uh, bilinear, you can choose it to be any, even zero. So So, keeping that freedom in my mind, I have just kept two two parameters here, and we will see what role they play. Okay. Stop. Okay. So, yes. And with this, then if you expand your Chandler and Gage field in terms of these generators, then the action that you will get would simply be uh, the following. so let now bindu sir you can probably uh, take a look at this so this is the first piece which we already had in the earlier case this is just the pure gravity piece now you have uh, the corresponding kinetic term for the fermionic fields so you have like two fermionic fields here and these are the scalar fields which are associated to the uh, i mean to the to the r symmetry generators and the central symmetry generator z that we have here so these are the things and uh, the information about mu these two parameters that i have introduced appears here so in present i mean if you turn on this mu then your theory gets modified from pure gravity with pure gravity you also have this chancerman term now the the gravity chancerman term actually appears for example we know that if you really want to write super gravity you should definitely take mu to be zero because you do not want this term to be there so that's okay i mean you, you can set mu to be zero that is a perfectly valid choice and, and that that does not disturb any of this uh, in any of this met any question sita sorry uh, i will just need to ask what is this l l of omega that you written oh this is the usual uh, get get chart the the gravity chart sir oh, and this is the gravity chart yeah. okay okay i had one one quick thing to ask yes so so the i mean algebra here uh, how how do you uh, so if you are thinking about the limit uh, you you said you start off with 
something which is uh, super symmetric and something which is not. No, no, uh, everything is super symmetric. Yeah, that is. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought I heard you wrong. So, what, what, what exactly do you? St I mean, start off with. Do you, do you start off with the? I mean, n equal to what? Uh, so, so in, so, in the I relativistic have, algebra. I have started with this algebra. No, no, I, I'm, I'm saying how, how, how do you arrive at that algebra? This is the, I mean, this is the super point carry algebra. Oh. This Sorry, I, I'm um, let's, missing let's not something. Let's not get into that name. I'm, I'm physically explaining you what algebra I'm writing. The no, algebra, uh, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, what, what I was asking is if you had started off with this uh, similar thing in the, I mean, ADS case, huh. what algebra did you need to start off there okay. in, in order to take a limit and get to this, okay. this algebra? Okay, I understand. So you yeah. should start with uh, um, one sector. So you will have a L plus and in that sector, you will have the fermionic, two fermionic generators and one R symmetry generator. I see. Okay. Okay. And in the other sector, you can only have this. I see. So, so you're starting off with something which, which has one, one sector with uh, fermions and, and, uh, and the other one, which is, yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank or, you. or, or, I mean, there are multiple ways. This is what I was trying to tell uh, there that there are multiple, so you can actually start with a, Two vira, two super symmetrized Virasov algebra. Yeah, but then, then, then you'll not get the, I mean, two, I mean, two, I mean, the two zero thing that you have. Uh, you, you will get. Uh, you will make sure that when you are taking that limit now, when you are uh -huh. multiplying by epsilon and taking that limit, in that process, one sector is just going to zero. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. So let me go to the next page. Yes. So, so Namito, just to huh? one minute to previous time. So this B and C are uh, are, are are scalar fields. Right. Uh, can you just go down? Um, uh, I can't see that actually. Yeah. So so, so what does B D C mean? Uh, so is this a what does it mean? form, right? This one. Ah. Or, or B and C are one forms or or scalars? So B and C are. B Oh, okay. So, 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 it, good question. So here I have written them as one form, right? Okay. So, 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 so I should think of B and C as one form. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is something like a BF theory uh, with the churn term. Uh, is that? This is what theory? Sorry. Uh, it, okay. It, it no, just... I will. I am. Uh, so my from the churn term perspective, I still have just a pure churn term. Whose gauge field is this? Yeah, yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about the R symmetry part of it, uh, if you want to call that, call it that. Yeah. So this R symmetry gauge fields. Yes. The two R symmetry gauge fields B and C. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, and these are both uh, like real abelian gauge fields. Right. Okay. And then they have this action, which is right. Uh, right. right. And the mu bar is like the Chern-Simmons level of uh, is related to Chern-Simmons level of the B. Well, you can think of it like that. Yes, for me, mu bar is just a parameter. That I can as well set to zero, but I need not set it to zero. And what I have done is I have not set it to zero and I will see the implications of it. Okay, thanks. Okay, good. Good, so now, uh, yeah. So now, once I have done this, so, the, so, so my next job is to basically start with the right uh, fall off, I mean, right to residual gauge field, and then look for the gauge transformations that will not change that fall. So that's exactly what I'm writing here. You can see that I have written down an A, and uh, I'm very sure that you probably do not remember the last expression. It's exactly similar to the last expression, but now I have extra pieces here, because my the, 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 the theory that I'm looking at is different. Now I have these super symmetric directions, as well as these R field symmetric directions. So I have, that is why I have turned on fields along those symmetry generators also. So for example, this part or these parts are exactly denoting. Okay, so this is a choice. And as I said, I mean, by choosing B in whatever way you want to with appropriate boundary condition, you can definitely start with other A's as well. And now we are looking for the gate symmetry, uh, the, the gate symmetry transformations at boundary such that this form remains unchanged. So by demanding uh, that, by satisfying the equations of motion at the boundary and by demanding that the gauge transformations satisfied at the boundary, one can actually fix this parameter, this P's, this P's, this P's, this J's, Shy's, this Tau's and this G's, 
and all these parameters that are coming out here, you can find them. And then with those, you can write the construct that corresponding concept chart and can write down the symmetry algebra from that concept chart, from the modes of that concept chart. And that turns out to be this. Okay, so this is, this is what we call the asymptotic symmetry of n equal to two comma zero flat supergravity. And this is like the most generic n equal to two comma zero BMS3 algebra that you can have. What do I mean by that? I mean, by most generic, I mean, uh, look at the following. So here P with J, the central extension is governed by K, which is the level of your chance of theory. Whereas for J with J, the central extension is governed by this new term mu. So it is different from that and it is non-zero. And as I told you that you can actually set mu equal to zero if you do not want that gravitational transformation term to be there, which in general, a pure supergravity theory will not have. And in that case, of course, you will not have a central extension in JM and J, which is perfectly okay. But in this way of doing, I mean, the way we have done it, we can actually understand where from the central extensions coming. Central extensions are simply coming from the fact that your metric in the D algebra space can could have been more generic. Okay, that if you allow that, then you actually get more generic central extensions. So and, here, uh, here G1 with G1 is, uh, is J, is it? Which one with which one, sorry? G, G1 with G1. G1 with G1, no, no, I, I, have, I, I don't have G1 with G1. G1 with G2 is non-zero. I have only written down the things which are non-zero here. So G1 with G1 in my definition is zero. I mean, you can certainly choose a different basis, right? So sure. in my definition, G1 with G2 is non-zero, but in an orthogonal basis, G1 with G1 will be non-zero, okay. G2 will be non-zero and G1 with G2 will be zero. Of course you can do that. Yeah. Okay. So, so yes. Uh, is there a particular string compactification which has this, uh, which gives this sugra and so on? Uh, 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 does any compactification gives you this, uh, this gravitational transformation term also? I don't know. Well, I, I don't know whether there is a, a compactification. So you want to like, preserve how many real supercharges exactly? Um, two. Two, two. Okay. Real supercharges which can mix among themselves. Mm. Okay. So yeah. another point that I want to make here, uh, and uh, I mean, I when I was studying it, I really liked it. So that's why I'm just telling you. Notice one thing that this asymptotic symmetry algebra can actually be much more generic than your flat, I mean, than your bulk algebra. Of course, that is true. We know that in the bulk, we only have point carried. Whereas when we are going to the asymptotic boundary, it is an infinite dimensional algebra. But even the zero modes of the, that infinite dimensional algebra can be more rich. I mean, it, even the algebra of the zero modes of your boundary generators can actually be richer than your bulk algebra. That is something that happens, uh, may, maybe not in this case, but uh, for more generic BMS3s that you can actually construct, for the most generic value of n that you can construct, there it happens. And this is a feature that is also true for asymptotically ADS spaces. They are also the algebra of the zero mode of your asymptotic symmetry generators are different than the bulk algebra. I mean, it's different from Pirasu. Sorry, it's different from super, uh, I mean, super symmetric version of Pirasu. So one more small, small interruption. So the question yeah, is, that uh, are you saying that there is no way to get uh, you know uh, something like a gg equal to j term g so equal to j you know some something like like g1 g1 equal to j n plus m because i i know of of algebras which have yes, that should be it, it is i i am not saying that i mean it is then you have to probably i mean okay the the symmetry algebra that i started with yes Okay. With that, if, so if I'm saying that I am starting with a supergravity theory whose symmetry is the symmetry that I started with, by that I mean this. Okay. Uh -huh. And then if I define uh, my, uh, my gauge field, the boundary value of the gauge field via this field shy. So just notice yes. what the, the, I mean, I have taken it with QIs, QI classes. Uh -huh. Okay. Then, and then if I am writing the algebra with the modes, so these G's are basically the modes of these fields. Right, right. 
then this right. is what no, I'm, okay. I'm just trying to make sense of this i mean the la last thing that you wrote that this is the most uh, generic and equal to 20 so by most generic i basically mean that this is the most generic possible super central extension that you can get. i see i see so so you so you want to fix that and you want to say that what are the yeah. central right. extensions so, right. okay. right. so, okay. so the Thank point you. is notice that this central extension is different than this central extension which is different than this central extension otherwise i mean if you just try to construct this algebras from from this inono wigner contraction you will see that this and that the central extensions will be related among them in most of them so i mean in this case you uh, i mean you, you have also checked that the uh, jacobi identity is whole oh, right yes yes yeah so the r r r thing will not fix fix the uh, no. jj central term exactly. Okay. exactly very good yes okay I mean, it, it is in that sense that I have written it is most generic. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, so, if you go to the action previously, huh. so you had a Chern Simmons for um, uh, for B. You had a BDB term. Hmm. You didn't have a CDC term. No. So, if you, can, you know, like, can I not turn on a CDC term? Will that give me an extra parameter? Or? No. So, no. See, the point is, this is not an action that you are writing. This is what you are getting starting from your original chance of an action. So I'll go back. Yeah, so uh, I guess. Right, what I'm trying, yeah. This is your starting action. You are starting from here and then, then you are just expanding your field. Uh, just bear with me. Yeah, you are you are expanding your gauge field in terms of that's what I've written here in terms of all these generators, and you are using the most ge most generic non-degenerate bilinear that you can have. So once you have done this, then this is what you get. Yes. So for example, what do you get for z comma z? Like uh, z comma z has to be zero. You cannot make it non-zero. You that... cannot make it non-zero. Then your uh, this metric would not remain non-degenerate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And Navita? Huh. Navita? Uh -huh, go ahead. Yeah, so, so what super concrete algebra would you start from to get uh, 1, 1? What super concrete? Okay, so here, you, you mean. Uh, uh, yeah, what changes would you make here to. I will, not, I will not write this. Okay. And I will not have this. You will not have the central charge? Yeah, I will not have the Z term and I will not have any T. It is there in my paper. Okay. It, 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 or in them, this is with you and me too, right? Yeah. So uh, there is a paper uh, with me too. If you look at it, we have studied both the systems. Okay. 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 Thanks. I mean, actually, that is a simpler version of this because the the, the fun that you get because of the presence of this R symmetry would be missing there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, so another question like, uh, what would you do to get two comma two? I mean, the next complicated person, two comma yeah. two. Yeah. Yeah, it's two, two comma two. Actually, you will have two copies of such bits. Two copies of such. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then they will also they will also talk to each other. So that is probably uh, in a hmm. in a paper earlier to uh, that is probably with uh, Orindam and Ivano. You can yeah, it it is there in one of my. Okay. okay. Yeah, man, I Now I'm really bored with it. <laughs> okay, anyway, let's go ahead. Okay. Okay, so now comes an interesting question, and that is can we have generic asymptotically flat bosonic solutions? Okay, so just to remind you, if you recall what we had learned from ADS3 CFT2 uh, analysis, the, the ADS3 CFT2 duality, there we first saw that the symmetries of both the theories are same. And then we saw that there were these BTZ-like solutions, right, which were different from, BTZ solutions are topologically different from ADS3 solutions, pure ADS3 solutions. So the question that we are asking here is here, can we also find the equivalent of BTZ-like solutions for these cases, okay? And the answer turns out to be definitely yes. Again, the, this, these works are also probably, this is probably first by Grumiller and uh, also Barnage. And what we have, what I have 
checked is even when you have these non-trivial R charges and fermionic charges, you can actually construct all those solutions and definitely their dynamics is much more richer because you have more parameters to play. Okay, so the answer is yes. Uh, so you can have more generic flat bosonic solutions and uh, and to get this, what you really need to do is following. Since the asymptotic symmetry is fixed, so you don't want to touch the phi component of this small gauge field, small A field, because that's what actually gives you the asymptotic symmetry algebra. Whereas the U component of A, that you can play with. So what you do is you basically turn on the chemical potentials for all your conserved charges. And once you do that, then with that and then demanding a proper uh, that, that nothing is singular, uh, all the solutions are well defined and those conditions will basically give you the new solutions. So what is, what is interesting is what is the characteristics of these new solutions. So these new solutions are cosmological in nature. So they also have a horizon which is very different, which is not a black hole horizon, this is a cosmological horizon, but that is what makes them very similar looking like the BTC solution. So BTC has a horizon and here also the solutions that you will get would have a horizon. This is, these are uh, actually Cauchy horizons. So outside the horizon, the space time is like time. Um, you have closed space-like hypersurfaces. Inside you have closed time-like hypersurfaces. And then you can actually define your space times properly to do your cosmology. In, in one, I mean, the, the main statement that I want to make here, here is, in this case, also you will find different solutions whose topology is different from the Minkowski or even different from just the ordinary bond unit. Okay, but you will find non-trivial solutions and you will find all their, I mean, if you want to, you can study their thermodynamics and also find their entropy. So, so the equivalence, I mean, if I want to map the advancement in this, uh, I mean, in, in, in flat space holography to ads 3 cft 2 even the step two works out. So the symmetries are same there and here. There you find non-trivial BTZ-like solutions and that tells you a lot about that duality. Here also you find non-trivial cosmological solutions and you can use it and study to understand the properties of the, uh, of some of the properties of the duality. So that is possible. I think there are like uh, particularly works by Grumiller and Urjun who have looked into it. Okay. Fine. So what have we learned so far? By the way, Siddharth, how much time do I have? No time. I guess I guess we've been having a lot of discussions during your talk. So, uh, so, so, how much do you think you'd need? Yeah, that's that's a very good. I mean, it just depends on how much you guys are going to stop me. Like, I can, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't have. I mean, I don't have a time constraint. So if it is okay from your perspective, uh, but yeah, yeah. I mean, like, uh, what is the timeline? Like twenty I, I minutes? Th I, I think it's okay. Yeah, another maybe fifteen twenty minutes. Uh, okay. Also. Okay, so uh, so I'll just hurry up a bit, but even then, I mean, if you have question, please stop me. It's it's not important that I have to finish the talk. So I mean, but but if we discuss, that's better. Okay, so since so you say so, <laughs> since you say so. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was ju just just uh, wondering what is so in in, in your last slide, uh, you 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 have a reference to a two thousand nineteen uh, uh, paper. So I was I was just 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 wondering what is. Uh, the new new things out here because I mean I we we have been doing this in around 2012. So what's what what exactly uh, do we have have new? I, I'm so what we have new, new yeah. so, so what we have new is basically trying to understand that the the algebras that you have constructed. I mean we had constructed long mm -hmm. back. Which mm -hmm. of them the the supersymmetric extension of those algebras? Which of them are really the symmetry algebras of a of an asymptotically flat gravity field. No, I was, I was just saying about the thermodynamics and all. So, is there some oh, new, new understanding which I have missed? No, no, no. Okay. Here, here, all I was trying to say is that even for these systems, right, of course, here the bosonic solution will be much more richer because you have more field into it. The, the basic yeah, but but you'll you'll I mean switch switch those off, right? I mean when 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 you want want to look at the, I mean the supersymmetric fields would be. No, switch off. With, why should you switch them off? Your your solution need not be supersymmetric, but your theory True. is supersymmetric. Okay, yeah. but aren't aren't you looking at particular but, I mean particular even zero even modes? If you, even if you turn, I mean, even if you are interested in a bosonic solution, you still have these R charges, no? This okay. 
that you have, they are still there. And in fact, they play a major role. They, sh they tell you that even if your system is not rotating, I mean, you might start with a system, you might start with a particle which is not rotating. But if, if, your part, I mean, if you are looking at a particle in a theory where there are R charges, you will still have non-trivial rotations and that will affect your engine. Uh, so, so uh, I mean, do you have, I mean, are you, are you, I mean, actually going to elaborate on this? I didn't get your question. I mean, are you, are you going to elaborate on, on oh, no, no, what no, no. the, uh, I, no, no, no. I will not elaborate on this. Okay. Because let's, the yeah. okay, okay. Let's, let's wait, wait, wait till the thing is over. We can, yeah. I mean, speak afterwards because <laughs> I don't want to hijack that talk. Yes, yeah. please go ahead. Okay. So, so far, what, uh, what we have understood is following that this, this CS, CS formulation is useful. The symmetries we can understand by using CS formulation. And of course, the bosonic solutions you can obtain. And that has different topology than the Minkowski space times. And the thermodynamics of the solutions work perfectly. Even with, I mean, it, it's much more richer and it definitely tells you more about the system. And then definitely the question that comes here is, can we found the bound? Can we find the boundary theory? In, in other words, what I'm trying to say is following, that now we have, we have seen that there are many different bosonic solutions, right? We, we, where all of them are asymptotically flat. I mean, they're they are different from each other in their topology. They're bounded, they, they're only different in, from that perspective. So can we understand like, the which, which theory will govern the dynamics of these solutions? I mean, can we really write down a two-dimensional theory which will actually govern the dynamics of these solutions? So that's the question. And the answer to the, that is also partially yes. I mean, I, I'm saying partially and you will see why. And to do that, we basically need to exploit the equivalence between Chan Simon and Wilson. Okay, so this is also something that we know and I'll skip a few slides here. We know that the Chan-Simon theory can actually be equivalently looked upon as a different theory, which is known as Wilsomino Witten theory. So Wilsomino Witten theory, just, just let me show you what this theory is. So this Wilsomino Witten theory is actually a very interesting theory, which has a two-dimensional part and a three-dimensional part. And this is actually a non-linear a non sigma model. And then you add this extra piece to it, which is a three-dimensional, a two-dimensional non-linear sigma model extended with a three-dimensional piece where the sigma is basically, this delta sigma is just the boundary of sigma, and this G fields are the extension of these small G fields to, to, to the bulk. Okay, so this is just the boundary of your uh, three-dimensional manifold that you can call sigma. Your, the, the, the sigma model fields are living on the boundary, and then you extend it to the bulk, the corresponding field is what is going to sit here. I mean, that's, what is that's what defines your Wilson-Winovitian model. And of course, at this level, you can already understand that this extension is it, it's completely arbitrary. I mean, I can extend it in certain way and you can extend it in certain different ways. So that is where the arbitrariness is in this, uh, in, in, in this uh, model. Of course, A's and K's are constants. And yeah, sorry. So for, for this model, you can actually construct a conserved charges. There, there is a current symmetry in this system. You can construct the currents. And from the currents, you can actually construct, do a Sugawara construction and can, and can also construct the corresponding stress tensor. You can write down the algebra of the stress tensor and you will see that if, if your Wilsumino Witten model, if you have written it for gauge two vessel 2R, then the stress tensors, the algebra of the stress tensors will just give you Virat. Okay, so that is the equivalence between sl 2 r Chan Simon with Wilsumino, or you can equivalently think of it as gravity in ADS3 with Wilsumino. Now again, a problem. Okay, so what we will be doing next is, sorry. Sorry, it's not working. Uh, yeah, no, it's like, after this, I somehow don't get the, uh, 
get those icons there so that I can just change its size, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. and now this time I'm also not being able to just... You don't see the thing on top also which says no, like... I don't, I, don't see, I don't see the thing on top to change my, mm -hmm. change my file and this, this time, uh, I'm, I'll just stop sharing and I'll just open it once more, so, sorry guys. It just goes away. When I do this, it just goes away. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, now it's visible. So what you can actually do is, uh, yeah. So what you can actually do is, uh, you can actually write down, so using this equivalent, that a chance Simon theory can actually be written down as a Vesuvino written model. You can try to do the same thing. You can for for the corresponding gravity theory as well, because we have seen that 3D gravity is equivalent to Chan Simon. So first you go to the Chan Simon uh, formula. I mean Chan Simon form of it, and then you write down the equivalent version, you know, model for it. But you might ask, like, why? Why is that interesting? It is interesting because although these Vesuvino Witten models are actually three-dimensional models because it does have a 3D piece, but the dynamics of all these fields are actually two-dimensional. So the variation of a zoom innovative model, if you are doing it, is actually a completely boundary term. So the entire dynamics of the fields are in Gs, and they actually lie on delta C. And that's exactly what we are looking for. We are trying to find that two-dimensional theory, which will give us, which will govern the dynamics of the solutions that we actually have. So that uh, that one can do. And to, to do that, basically, the, the most important step to keep in mind that your gauge field is highly constrained because if you remember, we had chosen a particular fall-off condition and we have not allowed any gauge transformation that will take me out of that term. So since your gauge fields are highly constrained, so your phase space, the corresponding phase space that you will write for them would also be a constrained phase space. And once you take that fact into account, you need to write down the proper boundary term to your to your chance Simon action so that the variations are well defined. And these two together will actually give you the corresponding Wilson innovation model. So that you implement this, it's a little technical, but of course, I mean, the, the idea is simple. So when you implement this, then you get, uh, you get the corresponding Wilson innovation, the, the two-dimensional theory that you want to. And here in this case, please don't look at it. I don't have time to explain this either. But what I'm trying to tell you that the two dimensional action that will govern the dynamics of the solutions that we have obtained a uh, few minutes back will be by this. Okay, this is a two dimensional theory. Of course, it has a three dimensional part as it is written, but one can show that with proper choice of fields, you can write this as a total derivative term. So it would just be a two dimensional term. And this is just, uh, this is just the, this, this is just a chiral Vesumino weighted model for gauge group ISO2 so This is the equivalent two-dimensional theory that you can write down, which will know the dynamics of your solution that you have. Okay, but again, at this level, uh, you can say that this is just an equivalence at the level of action. So what more do you know from here? So what you can actually show more is following, and I'll just tell you uh, the results. So, First statement is that the gauge and global symmetries of this chiral zoomino model can be obtained. In particular, you can show that the global symmetry will correspond to a current algebra, which is ISO 2,1, as I just said. And then you can do a proper Sugawara construction with some details put into account. And you can construct the stress tensors and other fields. And then from those charges, you can actually see, if you construct the algebra of those charges, you will see the same n equal to 2,0 BMS they coming up. Okay, so the final statement is following, that this dual Velzumino Witten model that we have, okay, let me go back, the, 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 the chiral Velzumino Witten model that we have just constructed, it's, it's same 
it knows, I mean, it can explain the dynamics of the solutions of your uh, asymptotically flat gravity theory, the, the non-trivial topological solutions. And two, they actually have, this theory exactly have the same symmetry of your asymptotically flat. So it is really the theory. I mean, it is really the version of that CFT2, you see. For, for ADS3, like when you were, when we were doing ADS3 CFT2 duality, we saw that the boundary theory is CFT2, which is, which is basically, which has the same symmetry as the asymptotic symmetry of ADS3. Here also, this chiral Velzumina model will have exactly n equal to 2 comma 0 VM. So it has exactly the same symmetry as the asymptotic symmetry of your boundary. Okay, so... Uh, Amita, so... So you're thinking about the Vezinovitan model as living at Stripe plus, yes. right? Uh, uh, on the hypersurface, yes, yes, by U and phi, yes. So, so it's, a, it's a one plus one D Stripe plus, which is a, which is a null, null something. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm just trying to, okay. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is sitting over there. So, uh, okay, I, 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 let me go to the outlook and then I'll tell the exact statements that I want. So this is like S1 cross R which is with a degenerate uh, metric. Yes. That's the manifold. Yes. And, uh, and the point is that, uh, none, uh, okay. And, and you can, you're saying you can define a Vezimino-Witten model on that. Yes. Yes. I, I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. With a pinch of salt. So the statement is following. So, so far we have seen, we have seen this uh, vezumino witten model coming up, which is living at uh, du d I mean, which is living at sky plus. Okay. And this Vezumino witten model, you need to, basically you will, this, this theory has a gate symmetry as well as a global symmetry. And since this theory has gate symmetry, so it's a constraint system. So you basically need to further constrain it to get the dynamics of, of the degrees of freedom. If you really want to construct the phase space, of the degrees of freedom of this theory, then you need to further constraint. And what that constraint version of this theory, okay, that, that you can call it to be a gauged by zumino witten model, okay, that theory has sees the BMS3 as its symmetry. Okay, so so to uh, so 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 the final statement is following that the dual theory of 3D flat gravity or 3D flat n equal to 2 comma 0 supergravity or any other supergravity that you want to think about is equivalent to a gauged Vezumino Witten model. That's the final statement. And, and we know all these gauged Vezumino Witten models for which, which can definite, I mean, which can come as a dual theory of all possible three-dimensional asymptotically flat gravity or supergravity or has been. That is what is known by me. Okay, that's the statement. So it's a gauged to a Vezumino Witten model, or you can also equivalently look at it as a Liouville model, flat Liouville model. So that, that's it. So I, I, I am at the end. So let me first tell what the final statements are, and then I'll go to the open questions. Okay, so the outlook is following that we have constructed a two dimensional theory sitting at the null infinity of 3D space time that has statement one exactly the same isometries as the asymptotic symmetry of the bulk, describes the same classical solutions as that of the residual degrees of freedom of the 3D gravity, and can describe the dynamics of these configurations. And hence, we can conclude that classically, these uh, gauged vezumino or the Liouville-like theories that we have constructed are dual to 3D gravities. Okay. But this is just at classical level. Or uh, if I, I mean, if you just go back, uh, if we just go back to our ADS3 CFT2 lessons, then these are like the first four points there. So those first four points, we have an equivalence in this case also. But now comes the equivalence of the fifth point, because there we saw that the vertex uh, operators were actually mapped to these degrees of freedom, like the, the bar degrees of freedom of string solution. So can we do similar things even here? Okay, so those are the open questions. What can we say at the semi-classical level? Because this, this question, I mean, does not, it is not a precise question. So let us try to make it precise. What can we really look at? The first thing to look at is following that, can we construct vertex operator in string theory, but now in flat space times, and then can identify those vertex operators with these global degrees of freedoms, with these global solutions that we have? Is it possible to do it? 
so this is exactly the equivalence of uh, given kutaso what they did for ads3 cases so they computed the vertex solutions for the string theories in this ads spaces and then showed that the, those vertex operators are exactly in one to one correspondence with the solutions that they were getting is it possible to do the similar thing even here of course you need to know a string theory in a flat space for that in in 3d flat space for that. okay but if if that can be constructed or if you can think of it as i mean if you can can do it by taking some limit of their calculation is also interesting and it is not known so far to my knowledge and another way to look at it would be following that can you find the equivalence of string s matrix with the correlation functions of this liouville like theory that we have just try to i mean in the liouville like theory i think the correlation functions are also partly known not exactly maybe in the supersymmetric case but for for at least in the simpler case probably it is known but what would be interesting is to see that if these correlation functions can also show up somehow in the stringy correlation i mean string in the stringy s matrix in asymptotically flat spaces if if it is not possible to do directly in the flat spaces can somehow the limit of ads3 calculations give us those okay if if those can be shown then this equivalence can be taken i mean we can take it farther away from the classical limit right now it is just at the classical limit by that i mean we have the actions which can actually govern the dynamics of the same solutions it also has the same symmetry but we do not know anything more than that so of course these are things that one should be looking at and yeah i i'm i'm trying to look at it yeah so that's all thank you so now if you have any question please go ahead okay th thanks navamita for that uh, very fa fascinating talk and for letting us uh, interrupt you so many times uh, let's please clap for navamita <laughs> okay uh, we can now get have more questions now with i have a question actually about the last uh, last uh, so in 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 the ads3 cf2 context uh, cf2 context the resumino witten witten model was the basically the uh, obtained from the coadjoint orbit of the asymptotic symmetry group right so there the uh the there also there is this asymptotic symmetry group of uh, basically corresponding to the brown hanno gravitons right that witten yes. and maloney uh, and then you look at the coadjoint orbit of this uh, group and uh, then you have the yeah you can get vesumino by doing that or you can just do a hanno type calculation where where he basically uh -huh. did exactly what i said he was basically gauging i mean uh, finding the chan simon action adding the appropriate boundary term and gauging it finding it i see i see so you, We are saying that if you did it because here also you can look at the coadjoint orbit of the asymptotic symmetry group. Ah, okay. Bani has done. Bani has done. The other question, yeah, the other question I was about about topology change. So this uh, somehow uh, I thought these are all diffeomorphisms connected to identity, right? Because uh, you are just looking at large diffeomorphisms. Uh, uh which are no. not uh, which are generated by vector fields right right so then why why do they yeah. why would they cause to fall yeah okay no so that uh, that no so that is that by turning on the diffeomorphisms what i was i mean okay or, or in the chan simon language by just looking at the gauge transformations what i was trying mm -hmm. to understand is what sort of gauge transformations i can give to this system so that my asymptotic symmetry does not change okay yes now i am doing something more than that of course i am giving only those gauge transformation that is not disturbing my asymptotic symmetry but on top of that i am turning on some chemical potentials which um, which basically means i am playing so okay so at at the level of uh, the the fields let me just get back i'll tell you exactly what i am doing so you see this a had a had a a phi piece and a a u piece right so this part is au because this is with the u and this is a phi for for getting the asymptotic symmetry what is important is this a phi part i can also tell you why so just uh, a sec yeah you see the charges that you construct whose modes give you the symmetry algebra comes from the delta oh, a phi okay. so au does not really play a role here at the level of asymptotic symmetry but au plays an important role to get the boundary met mm -hmm. okay fine so so you have more freedom left at the level of au 
So now what you try to do is you, you play with that and you turn on the chemical potentials there. You have these kinds of charges. So you now turn on chemical potentials corresponding to that and see what more solutions can I construct such that my asymptotic symmetry will not change because I have not touched mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. so when you do that, then you get solutions with different topology. In particular, the solutions that I was getting has a topology of a time times a solid torus. I see. So yeah, but that's in the in the, in the but there, there must be solutions which are different than the flat. I mean the three D Minkowski, but are not topology changing, right? Yeah, that because is also, if you just apply, uh, yeah. if you apply super translation, the much yes. something must come, which is yes, yes, that uh, is also, is not there. Yeah. I see. But basically, what I was trying to see, see, uh, I mean, uh, at the beginning, I said that gravity in three D is interesting because although all solutions are locally Minkowski, but when you are looking at their topology, they can be different. So I was trying to construct a solution which will have a different topology than Minkowski. And this is a way to get. Right, right, yeah. right. And I was, I was trying to make a comparison with the ADS3 where you have the modular transformations, but you also have this brown Hano gravitons, which, yes. which are basically like soft modes. Uh, yes. which, so which give you different solutions, they don't change the topology. But, uh, I mean, right. you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. These okay. are not that. Yeah. These are not that. But if you did, uh, if you just applied a super translation, then you get a solution which is not top, not topology changing, yeah. but different solution. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. So one more thing to ask you again. So, uh, um, so I remember a similar thing being done by, I mean, Glenn and I think Dora and possibly Ricardo Troncoso and so on. Did they do it for the n equal to one case? And uh, you guys have generalized it for the yes. higher end case. They just did it without the art charges. Yes. I see. I see. So and so so what's what's the uh, I mean what what's, what's do, you, what art charges do to the system? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that so that would be a good good right, thing to. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is, if this J field, no, it's basically physically corresponds to a rot rotation. It gives you angular momentum to your body, and you may think of a system where you don't have that. But if, if, you, if the particle that you are looking at is actually a solution of n equal to 2 comma 0, I mean, where you have these R charges also, then even if you start with a non-rotating system, but those R charges will actually give you rotations. Okay. So it brings more, I mean, in, in that sense, it brings more feature to your solution. That even if your particle, the, the particle that you are looking at is not rotating to begin with, but those extra scalar, scalar fields will give it an effective so that's what the art charges do. I mean, that's that's actually a, 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 an interesting thing because when we sort of rederive, I mean, when when we derive this BMS, I mean, Cardi-like formula, we uh, yeah yeah. If you go 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 back to that, I know you know, I know that something yeah. in 2012. So you you'd find that we were not really able to address the case where there was no 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 rotation. No. We always had to put in a little rotation for things to work. Yeah. Because uh, this this is what what corresponded to the shifted boost orbifold. That is the one one that gave you this this horizon that you spoke of. So the zero uh, rotation case always is something which is a, a singular thing to do. So it's nice that this I mean n equal to two actually gives you this rotation. Absolutely, physically yeah. that's really okay. important. What I'm trying to tell you is that even you can get the same effect by turning on your R charges. Actually. That's right. Okay, that's 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 a nice nice thing. You know, just going to the uh, n equal to two theory. Okay, so that in, in in that sense, somehow the n equal to two theory is richer than the n equal to I mean one one theory. Of course, yeah. yes, okay. absolutely, because you have the R charges here. That's that's uh, that's that's an interesting thing. Okay, okay, thanks. So, uh, Namita, can I ask this question about this final comments that you're making about the string theory? Yeah. Uh, this is again this question of like what are the backgrounds in string theory which has this kind of supersymmetry? Like, uh, I mean, like, can you? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, can you start with M theory and put it on some compact? Yeah, probably. Eight manifold, I don't know, like. I mean that uh, okay. I'm not very well versed in this uh, uh, 3D stuff, but but most of the things that I know are all kind of more supersymmetry. Okay, most uh, natural things. Supersymmetry. I mean, I can actually increase my supersymmetry and 
it would not be a it would not be extremely difficult for us to understand like how these things will change that's not the problem problem is do do we know of any string theory in three dimension on flat space so okay so so if if you compactify it on some eight manifold um like there's some sometimes you compact with an eight manifold with some spin seven or something like that. I I saw a paper by um, I mean okay they they were basically talking about strings on it just a second. Uh, I'm in a talk. Yeah. So we were yeah I was basically um, looking at this paper by Gibbon Kutasov. So they have definitely talked about strings on ADS three, but they have at least written that. Similar things can actually be also. I mean, so there are references that do talk about strings on flat spaces as well. But I have not. Uh, yeah, they are not very easy to understand. But probably there are. I mean, honestly, saying what I thought would be possible to do is to basically take their result. I mean, given to Tasov, which is on ADS three, and then take the ADS ADS goes to infinity limit. And see if those solutions somehow can be mapped to the solutions that we have. I mean, they have shown it in presence of ADS, right? So, yeah, so but, the degrees of freedom are also different, and they show that they showed that the two things are same. But we can do the calculation in one side. I mean, we can find the these extra degrees of freedom directly in asymptotically flat cases. But in the stringy scenario, in case we cannot find a theory on flat, I mean, a string theory in 3D flat space. Can somehow taking the ADS result and taking some limits suitably can give this would be interesting. Yeah, but, but, but I, I would think uh, wouldn't it be easier to directly write on the flat space solution? Usually, I, flat space solutions are. Yeah, I. Okay. Why did people write about it so far? Yeah, I don't know really. So I yeah. think people have, may have actually written about it. I mean, uh, uh, this this is this is our older paper from two thousand. Two, three, something like that. So, uh, Pornalba and Costa, when they were trying to write these, uh, I mean, cosmological solutions down for the first time, they. No, no, I'm talking had, about string theory on a uh, flat space. Can no, you... they, 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 they have. They tried to write down. Uh, they try try to embed these things in string. I mean, string and M M M theory as well. I I don't remember them explicitly oh, well, you, but. Can you tell me the reference, please? There is, there is, there is something. I think this is Cornalba and Costa, and it's called a new something cosmological scenario in string string theory or something like that. And they also have a review after that. So uh, that that may be something useful if you are looking in this particular direction. I I, I don't remember the exact details. No, that's okay. We can. I can. But, but yeah, but yeah, yeah, that that I think may be something. Yeah, because useful. I think you, you know, I mean. To my understanding, like all these constructions that you can actually have a 2D theory, I mean, you do have a 2D theory, would be useful only if you can say something more than the classical. I mean, if you can make a statement at the semi-classical level using these theories, then it would be useful. Otherwise, yeah. these are nice constructions. Yes, you have dual theories, so what? I mean, finally, at the end of the day, if you do not have something more than that, it, it's not. Yeah, so I thought like one possible one thing to do would be to basically see like if these vortex kind of vortex operators are also visible here. But yeah. I don't have a concrete answer to that. So what you want is something like uh, some string theory, not a, not even M theory, right? Because yeah. if, you, if you if you if you uh, have like I think uh, I think with M theory, F theory, and so on and so forth, you can get some background. But then if you want a given quotas of construction, you need to know. What the world sheet is and and what it happens, and uh, and if it is like uh, M two brains and so on and so forth, we don't quite know what to do. Um, yeah. That's true. Yes. But uh, so so I guess you want something like um, yeah, some type two theory or something compactified in a certain way, yeah. uh, keeping it in weak coupling so that uh, and then you get a supersymmetric background. I guess uh, yeah, I, I guess people who know more supergravity than I should. Uh, Probably yeah, safe. How Bindusa can help us a bit. Bindusa, do you know anything about like this? I'm not sure he's around, but yeah. So he has left. Yeah. But, uh, uh, sorry, Rich, uh, Shamit, Kajuru and all had uh, some 3D string theory with this, you know, this umbral moonshine type construction few years back, 2017 and all. They had a compactification to 
BB, right? Which, which seems super chargy or something. I don't know if Kachuru at all. Okay. I, yeah, I have to take, look, I, I don't know. So their construction was ADS3 or uh, flat space? Yeah. yeah, that I don't remember. It was a while back, 2017. Oh, ADS3, yeah. Yeah, I think there are many ADS3. But, uh, mm -hmm. I see, I see. Um, now the things that I'm familiar with is, you know, you can put M3 on Nate manifold. And, uh, and do something. Um, yeah. So, so this is in the yeah, context of trying to get the n equal to one yeah, theory mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, yeah, if somebody else. But but you don't know of an example. That that's what you're saying. Number. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, this is something that uh, I I am I'm thinking about, but I. I mean, one side I understand, the other side is like, I don't know yet. Okay. Uh -huh. Right. So, I mean, if, if it was there, it would be very good because one, one can then uh, exactly. you know, do the given quota, so kind of construction. Exactly. exactly. Because, and, yeah, because this side is, I mean, from the, from, from, from the flat side, we know exactly, the whole zoom, you know, we, we know exactly what it is, what the theory would be, what are the solutions that we know. We can do any calculate. I mean, in any other computations also can be done. I think people have already worked this uh, two point functions in this level. I mean, at least in generic level, people have done it. So it would not be very difficult to do it even in this. So, but but the point is, we want to map it to some concrete calculation there. I mean, we want to see that equivalence. So that is where the yeah catch is. So, sir, the, uh, the string theory story is understood for ADS3 constructions? Ah, or, uh, ah, ah, it is. It is. I mean, uh, either uh, I mean, you can look at given Kutasov or even Marcus and Auguri, long back. It's well understood. So, this uh, the this uh, coadjoint orbit theories that one gets, WZW theories, they are embedded in string theory coming from Kutasov. Uh, yes. Is that, uh, yes. Nice. I mean, well, I, I think so, yes. Even probably, yeah. yeah. Uh, Given Putasov has also talked about. But you mentioned uh, something about taking the flat space limit of those. That doesn't. Was, yeah, that is that was my last <laughs> last hope that maybe taking their result mm -hmm. for the appropriate case and just take a. Uh, I mean, I don't know what what would that limit really be, but if some limit of that result can give this. Uh, these things like the solution, the degrees of freedom that we have, or maybe maybe one need to really look at a two point function and can see like in certain limit those S matrices is uh, boiling down to these two point functions. Then also you will be able to make some step. Right. Yeah. If you're thinking of trying to take the limit at the level of the um, vertex operators, I think that's a slippery slope. No. Uh, because <laughs> but 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 yeah. So there, I mean representation theory inputs would, would sort of kick in and that that might be more I mean more non-trivial uh, than, than, I, than remember, to I remember Arjun you telling me long back that uh, not everything really I mean this taking this limit does not really work in, in not not I mean you know it, it works <laughs> works in weird ways so 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 you know I mean the uh, the straight, straightforward thing, which which you uh, I mean, know well by now, of course, is is that if you're just looking at high weight states, they do not go to high weight states, and and then then you need to go on to these uh, induced representations, and uh, that that is where this I mean whole <laughs> I mean I I, I guess a quite uh, joint orbit way of trying trying to do things may be more more useful that way, so yeah. But but yeah, you might have more. I mean, more luck. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it is. Yeah, I mean, the, the how to take that limit is definitely is the question. If you want to do it by taking a limit. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's yeah, easier just, just just to actually do do the thing than than I mean, trying to take the limit. But you know, and those are just vague words. So <laughs> read nothing into that. Yeah. 
there is yeah there there are no start i mean problem is like since you do not know a theory that's the problem i mean at least i don't know i was looking into this kuban kutasov's paper like uh, that also maybe like two months back but they have talked about that like something like this should be or is true i, I remember the statement being is true that not should be true uh, for flat space cases as well but uh, not too much not too concrete Yeah, so this is what is my understanding at least uh, about the status of the field so like this is what is known and of course it is uh, like nowhere close to the to the real reality what do you should be looking for what I mean, we must be looking for but at least few steps works out Okay, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Nababita again. Uh, I'll stop uh, the recording. And uh, if you guys, if you, if you, if you guys still want to uh, discuss, we can, we can do, we can continue for a bit if you.